Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Post the Pop Course Tour. I'm your host, Dan Tages. This is my co host, BG. Say hello, BG. Hi there. So, welcome to the great Z Punt Cordat. This will be a first part in a three part series looking at trying to establish what the zebras were like both before FOE and during it, trying to build a cohesive world space for it all. But I'd also like to welcome now some new faces and some returning ones. First, would like to welcome uh, Moonlight Grimoire. Say hello if you would. Hello. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Sour Cherry. Hello. Uh, Nexus of Concordia, are you here? Hello. And Wack, I would like to welcome you too. Good evening. So, let us be uh, starting at where we think the beginning should be in all of this, because, frankly, uh, we know very, very little about the zebras. We don't even know what their, where la their land looks like, unless you take the maps that, that have uh, circulated, as it were, from Hasbro, which are of dubious value. Yeah. So our first topic tonight would be the groundwork. What does the, the actual physical land space in which the zebras inhabit? Uh, so our first thing tonight is the continent. Do they, do they live on a different continent? We don't know. But... Uh, I'd like to hear what all of our guests have to say on this matter. Nobody answer all at once. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. uh. Well, um, what we've seen from the IDV comics um, which are actually going to the Zebra um, homelands um, in the season 10, so to speak, is that they travel to it by boat. So we know there's at least an ocean between them. And it, it it's not like a small dinghy that mm. they use. It's a proper goddamn ocean traveling boat. Hmm. An ocean liner. I mean, the only thing so, that the only thing that we know for certain that's canon to FOE is that wherever the zebras live and where the hook the ponies live is connected via a land bridge of some description. Mm -hmm. Something that's vaguely like, well, it's in, it's kind of outrightly stated that there is a land connection between the two. We don't know what that looks like, but there is a land connection. It could be as a different. Well, part of the equestrian content that they control in some manner. That is possible, but mm, I don't know. It seems impractical to keep trying to supply a place that that's cut off from the rest of your um it, the uh, land. In mass. this case, in this case, we'll say it may seem impractical, but we can take parallels to the Chinese invasion of Alaska in Fallout Universe in this particular case. Yeah. I mean, it is impractical. Yeah, sure. It is impractical, but it occurred, and the Chinese, in that particular case, managed to overrun the uh, American defenses there and held Alaska for at least a few mm -hmm. years. So. There is also the fact that the, well, the war on their part was partially because they needed gems, so the place could have been like a very good source of those. That is a so fair it would have been point. A great value. That is a fair point, but it is somewhat implied that um, it's that gemstones from Equestria. Mm, they just didn't have any. They 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 traded something they had in abundance for something Equestrians had in abundance. Which could point to still the fact that they, in their homelands, just did not have 
much in the ways of gemstones, but plenty of coal. Or, or the quanti uh, quality of the gemstones in zebra homelands is not sufficient. That can happen. For example, for a real world um, equivalent would be um, people in arid regions, namely around Sahara Desert, need to buy sand to uh, construct uh, buildings and cement because the sand in Sahara is not um, good for that kind of work. It, it's not sufficient. So it could be that the gemstones that zebras have, even if there were a lot, it's not suitable for what they need it for. Well, that is the thing. Actually, if I would like to interject a little bit, because um, this is something that was brought up in uh, Project Horizons, that it's not like the zebras didn't have any gemstones. Is that because of MacGuffinry? Because it was MacGuffinry. Um, the gemstones that are in Equestria are different and better than those you find natively to where the zebras live. But that is neither here nor there. Because let's not take one. Uh, let's not just take something from one fic just because. plausible as it may be. Yes, because mm -hmm. different regions will have different characteristics for formation of various gems. Yes. Uh, it may also be the fact that Zebras just exhausted their natural sources of gemstones. Mm -hmm. That's also possible. I mean, it is implied in the original that Equestria exhausted their native supply of coal, and that's why they turned to zebras. So it could have been a mutual situation of both ran out of the resources that they used to maintain their economy. I do have to wonder how you run out of coal of all things, though. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Mostly, I'd imagine that, well, the need overrides uh, the amount of supply that you can get in um, in a matter of time. I mean, okay, so this is a thing that, uh, what is it, like uh, Nexus brought up to me, that it's pretty obvious that, um, what is it, that Equestria is based on America, and America has ass tons of relatively easy to get materials. Like, it, it, it's not even funny. I've spoken to this with a couple of friends who are quite into geology, and America is just great for harvesting resources because it's, for the most part, pretty stable. There's not a lot of, like, weird uh, tectonics for most of it, and most of its continental shelf is stable. So it's easy to extract. So seeing as it's supposed to be implied that it's meant to be at least a little bit of a stand-in for America. Where, why, where is their materials? Like, what? They should have a lot more materials than is implied. Well, the obvious answer for one would be that it's not, not that similar to America. Anyway, yeah, sorry. it's not one to one. Granted, uh, as well as um. What kind of coal? Magical? Um, you know, it's not necessarily regular coal as we know it. Granted. It could be, and I mean, considering that they can get gemstones that are cut, not raw, cut out of straight goddamn stone. I think I'm that's going a local. To assume I think, uh, I the... think it's sorry. You carry on, Tower. You carry on. I think it's fair to assume that the coal that they have behaves differently than it does in our world. Ergo, uh, they might not 
it might be rarer just simply because of that. There's some magical component to it or, or something else. Okay, that's a granted point, but let us try and move a little bit back to um, what the actual original point was supposed to be. Uh, where do the zebras actually live? Is it a separate continent with no... Uh, oh, pardon. I'm so sorry. Is it a separate landmass with no connecting thing? Because, like, it is implied that there is some sort of connecting landmass, but as you have all uh, pointed out, that it is possible that it isn't. It's just a bit of land that would be on the equestrian continent that they colonised. So, to go with that, I would point to that with regards to Equestria versus Zebra Homelands, Zebra Homelands could be just in general a uh, situation like North America and South America where there's a tiny land bridge between the two. But for the most part, you don't want to take that trek because it is not the most generous route to go. You can make much better speed across the ocean than trekking along the land, especially mm -hmm. since it's probably not developed. Yeah, which is actually the case with the with the uh, with actual with, with the Central Yeah, with the actual with the actual Panama Peninsula, you cannot actually drive through uh, from South America to North America and vice versa because the area between Panama and Colombia is that little bit there is just bad terrain mm -hmm. for any kind of uh, road-based travel. Yeah, so two, mind, two mountainous and two, uh, it's, just, it's just covered in the jungle. Okay. So something similar may be uh, between uh, Zebra Nation and Equestria, as Munat mentioned. Um, but but it may it can be something a bit more. Um, it can be something a bit different, as it's not an exact copy. Uh, that, that, that the terrain is just harsh when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the weather or condition of that. The, the, like you're suggesting that there is perhaps be... some sort of natural yeah. barrier there. Mm -hmm. Or that driving an army through would be like committing to land war in Asia. Yeah, yeah pretty and... much. And I think that would be the most logical explanation as to why ponies in peacetime would prefer to use boats. Yes. It's faster, it's safer, relatively at least, and uh, easier than the one land bridge that they have. Yeah. I mean, what to me, it comes to mind, especially that sometimes I've been referred that the land bridge goes over the North Pole equivalent or something like that. It has been tossed around mm. at times. But if that would be the case, then it very well would be in wartime, basically the Alpine campaign in World War One, but on steroids. Fucking... Uh, Hannibal, eat your goddamn heart out. <laughs> no, I... Well... I know what you're on about. Yes. I'm just saying that uh, it, it, there will be something of a overlap there. A um, a dry climate dwelling people trying to cross the fucking Alps. Maybe we just go for naval invasions at that point. Pretty much... Pretty much the naval invasion would be the best option there. But that's uh, that's more a bit one in the future when it comes to tactics. Yeah, that, that we'll we'll cover that eventually in like part three when we're going to get on to the uh, the Zebrican military and probably by extension the Zebrican navy. Hmm. But uh, that is some time away. Uh, Sorry, carry on, Moonlight. You feel free to enter here. All right, I think we can agree that if there is land bridge, it is at very least not something very well developed, nor is it 
faster than going by ship. So it would be a situation that it's just not something that most people would want to be using because not mm. way longer, it's uncertain to get through. Granted, but it is heavily implied through every of all of the major fix that this is the case. Uh, and it's kind of, I'm pretty sure it was mentioned explicitly that that shattered hoof ridge, the real one, the one where the big peace accord took place, uh, that went horribly, horribly wrong, uh, yes, is, is on the land bridge. Land. Yes. Which would point to a more... a longer but more temperate or Mediterranean climate, but yes, it would that. probably be a situation of extremely impassable and probably for Eastern War, they either did a major industrial situation and just leveled the place so they could move through or dug a tunnel through, which is crazy, but it would definitely catch Cluster off guard. Yep. You know, uh, it, it, sorry, carry on, carry on. You step in, yeah. Mike. <laughs> yeah, I will quote the uh, quote some portion there because the Shutter Root Reef actually is a barren rocky portion of a question on the other side of the border. So it is full of deep cracks and ravines, so it's extremely impassable terrain. Uh, so it pretty much fits the bill when it comes to the uh, ease of conducting warfare there. Okay, uh, I think we have at this point established that yes there's a land bridge and yes it's very difficult to go through yes should we move on e yes i think we can move on to the next key point um what does it actually look like uh because i have a thing for everyone to look at both at home and in chat i would recommend if you haven't already got onto the twitch everyone in chat uh, everyone oh, in no. in here that you might want to, you know, get on there so you can see this. Oh no. I'm just gonna throw it in there without context. So I'm gonna give it some context if you if you let me, Nexus. So Nexus with uh we had discussed at some length before we started doing the show. Um what the climates of the, or rather like the biomes of the Zebrakan content might look like, as well as a general idea of what maybe the Zebrakan content would be, where it would be based upon our own maps. Uh, and what we came up with was, um, well, this, I'll put it up for you. Or what he came up with more specifically. It looks horrible. It is horrible. Everything um, has to start somewhere. Yeah, it's so, um, are you like, is that for size or just a general shape? Um, both possibly. Because that's huge. That's several, several, several Russians. I mean, so... it's got at least like seventy percent of Russia in it. So the context he's living at is, this was my suggestion if we go with the idea that it is a very large content, in which case this would be useful for figuring out what kind of biomes they would have. But, you know, this is... But that is has all the biomes. Pretty much. And this is also for, like, a different topic as well. And that's coming later. So yeah, there is still a lot of context missing for this. There is. Um, so let us um, move back to something more pleasant to look at. Uh, a small stripe horse. As for my idea of biomes, I did spend some time thinking about this. We, I mean, we know the. We we have to take a bit of a roll because there's nothing really in MLP telling us about their setup. But 
my idea being since Equestria is basically a North America and Europe smashed together, it would make sense that the uh, you'd have the zebra homelands are more of a Southeast Asia Africa. So you have a good mix of different climates that you can have in there. Obviously we have more of a savanna sort of situation. Um, just because obviously they went heavily to that's how zebras were in the majority. But it also gives us a wide range because uh, the Horn of Africa is a much more temperate location. I mean, like the Horn of Africa is kind of almost like Southern Europe in climate for the most part. Yes. So like kind of Spain, uh, North Africa kind of climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be fair, Africa, I mean, it does have a few areas where there is jungle, but that's mostly along the Congo. That's more of a Southeast Asia and um, South America thing than it is Africa. Because it's honestly more plains and grassland. That's the reason why zebras have their stripes. I spent too much time researching zebras. Mm -hmm. So it's more likely that we're looking at a, probably one large island with a couple of biomes on it, and then a number of uh, smaller islands around it. So you have a bit of a breakup in how they have the climate, as well as also a reason for the way for their technology to have differentiated, because they do point towards a more, ah, what was it? more robot focus in a lot of ways and vehicle focus than Equestria's Railway, and railways don't do terribly well with large bodies of water? No, no. Uh, they tend to get very waterlogged. Yeah. Transatlantic Railway when? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not impossible, but let's not try and uh, worry ourselves about that. Uh-huh. Uh... -huh. uh but um, I personally liked more what Nexus thought it would be like. If you'd like to elaborate further what we discussed upon. You're going to have to be more specific than that. I mean, okay, so the map that you gave me covers a good chunk of the world. So you also mentioned... Um, Brain just farted completely. But the the whole thing was that you had like three big cultural groups of zebras, like super cultures, because of these areas being so their, their biomes are all related to each other, so that would create um, big so, cultural he he hegemons in these areas. What I was sort of trying to illustrate with the map is that different groups of bi uh, <clears throat> biomes um, have different... They test cultures in different ways, they demand different things of them. And this would likely create significant differences between different, if you will, climate groups. And that might lead to large groups of cultures appearing that within, well, amongst themselves are quite similar, but, with the, but uh, between the groups you would see significant differences in outlook and culture and worldviews and such. That's sort of what I was trying to illustrate with the map. Well, if we go uh, with the idea of a large continent. With, but so that, um, to, the idea itself is sound. However, I do not see, for example, the reason why the zebra continent 
and I'm going to use the word continent here, land, uh, land bridge or not. Um, I don't see it having temperatures such as Russia has. But yeah, again, this was if the world is large, in which case there is a very good chance it would reach into the northern hemisphere, in which case you mm. would have climates like that. But I, at the same time, I do not see a reason why uh, Zebras would one want to inhabit it, and um, two, um, I see no reason for them to develop um, stripes in an area like like Siberia is, which is too cold to really even have people living in it. I am pretty much. Like, like so, I said, this is a big if kind of map. Yeah. Which is like, why I didn't really like the idea of putting it on there. Basically, well, like uh, Moonlight said, the reason why zebras, and I do mean um, in real life zebras, develop their stripes is protection from predators in grasslands. So... And that's one of two reasons. The other is that the stripes cause less insects to pop on them and start eating at them while they're still kicking. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, the stripes... Um... Greatly confuse insect vision. Yes. Yes. Uh, what ends up happening is they mostly land on the borders of the stripes, which is a far less amount of surface area of the body. As such, um, I do agree with the idea of having kind of three culture hegemonies going on within the zebra uh, territory, I guess is the best way to put it, because they're spread out over the area. The main part is going to be more of the plains style zebras. And then in real life, we also have mountain zebras, which are in a more temperate climate that it has a bit less food. It's basically like Spain. So I mean, frankly, it's like Spain. For me, what I was looking at there was kind of like spheres of expansion for the zebras. So. Of, I imagine they all started off in the... Actually, let's bring up the map. I imagine they all started in this area at the furthest west on the map. They started in this area and had... This is where their, quote-unquote, homeland is. So, to bounce off that idea, since I mean, we're, we're saying that they're starting in the, in the grasslands of the Africa equivalent, Mm -hmm. And then they had multiple spheres of expansion as population grew and their ability to survive in harsher climates grew. Yes. And, you know, in general, conquest. Yes. Conquest is fun. Yes, because yeah. it's clearly implied that they are an empire, and empires indulge in this thing called colonialism and imperialism. Let's not dwell on this for too long. These are just observable facts. And No wonder all empires are evil. And since we're back at the map, if they went that far north into that sort of climate, I, I imagine the, uh, the Russian Empire did resources and clay. Mm. And then most live um, and, you know, in the um, west side of uh, the Russian Empire. <laughs> and, you know, that would result in... Uh, a periphery region, a colonial region dependent on the other regions. Yeah. But uh, that might be getting a little off topic. Yeah, that's going a bit further into what, where we want to go. But suffice to say, I am inclined to believe that it's... They had this sort of, like, Africa-equivalent continent where they started. They then expanded into the more India-Middle East Part, and then finally the third expansion is out into these much more colder, more temperate-ish climes further north. And 
in, and I imagine this is where a number of other species and their kingdoms live and or used to live. Yes. Um, my thought would be they did expand in that sort of manner, but they probably also expand a bit further. Like, if we're using this as a sample, they're going to want to stick to similar climates for proper uh, territory plans because they can inhabit it. It's not as hard to deal with. So it might be a more purpley claim that has other species that they work with or work under them in the more Russia analogy, while they, for population reasons, went more into the Southeast Asia for a proper third sphere. So it's that sort of idea of, hey, this is akin to where we normally live. We can really put a lot of population here because we've been booming since our second sphere of expansion. While the northern reaches is more, well, we need this to fuel everything else. You know, also potentially putting, you know, buffer states between them and the homelands. Yeah, I was yes. able to go with that there, that basically marchers, buffer states, stealth states would preferably be in the northern areas where they can send a some sort of a governor there to rule over, while you know, the locals handle most of the, uh, most of the actual. Ruled by farm. locals in name only. Yes, yeah. pretty much. Could be that the rule is it themselves it would be locals, but then they have the um, imperial liaison or something like that, uh, to, to keep an eye on everything. So that's going further so, down the line. So basically, going India. Um, so this actually... Which, uh, um, British Empire. Um, yes, so this actually goes into the next topic here from the groundwork. Their neighbors and neighboring powers. So, uh, I imagine that is well, we don't. Let's, let's start with the first race on the list, uh, the Yaks. Well, honestly, I do not really see zebras and yaks having much of a um, relation. To each other, mostly because I do not agree that zebras would live so far up north, but also because I don't really see much trade that could or would happen between the two in their history. Not to mention that yaks, from what I gather, are pretty proud of themselves. Oh yeah, they they they're the they do not they would not like being um someone's subject at all. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that if there was contact between yaks and zebras, it was rather minimal and more of uh, you keep yours to your side, we keep to our side and we're good. Stay away from our mountainous clay and we won't trample your people to death. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Definitely, Yak Yakistan would be the equivalent of the graveyard of empires if everybody would even trap them to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Just Ev don't. Everyone. Like Vietnam. No, more, I was thinking more like Afghanistan because Af no yeah, one goes to Afghanistan without basically being shot to ribbons by the Afghanis. I mean, same for Vietnam. They've been fighting with the Chinese for. Thousands of years. Anyway, uh, also, off. <laughs> also uh, Russia. Nobody goes to Russia without uh, expecting to lose. Mostly the weather, but Which yeah, a bit more accurate on that point. Um, with regards to yeah, so given we see that, I mean, this, this gets into a bit of the history thing, but that does inform the biomes that zebras would be going into is that the Yaks live further north than the Crystal Empire. And the Crystal mm -hmm. Empire is a location that was pre-equestrian in existence and had a way to deal with the Wendigos making, you know, the frozen north the frozen north. So, Hostile as fuck, yes. basically. There's a reason why equestrian dumps is even worse things that can't go in Tartarus into the frozen north. <laughs> but that's getting away from the point. That and I mean, uh, uh, sorry, do continue. Um, so to me, that would say that zebras might have had envoys in the past to the yaks, just 
like every other race seems to have envoys to one another. Um, but there was no real strong connection between the zebras and the ants. Unlike probably the griffins, who are probably one of the few that they actually had long-term relations with, because griffins can kind of go anywhere. Speaking of griffins... Yes, I believe they're next on the list. Uh, yes. It's almost like everyone here has the list. Yes. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but yeah, speaking of griffins, considering they're birds, well, half birds, I do not see it all that impossible that griffins, well, while they do not necessarily migrate like birds do, um, they might be of, might have been nomadic That's in possible. nature at some point, meaning that they would have established connections fairly early on in, I think, zebra history. And as such, they would be something of a very long-standing ally, or at least in mutual agreement of not uh, killing each other. So here is a thing. Um, here's something that's going to be very contentious, but Griffins are Italians. Or Germans. They're or Germans, Germans, or both. Basically, mm -hmm. because they are so aggressive as a species, because let's not lie to ourselves here, they are very aggressive. They form little Natural petty players. kingdoms. Yep, they form petty kingdoms of their own, and they fight each other all the time. They got their, I imagine they've got their own bit of land that they're constantly fighting over, and, you know, they do like what the Germans and the Italians did throughout history, and sell their skills as soldiers to anyone who's willing to yeah, give them shine. Right. They're basically Swiss. They're the uh, Swiss. Swiss. <laughs> Swiss with more infighting. Yes. Yes. With, with extra yeah. infighting, yes. And love for gold. Oh Considering. My. Oh Swiss boy. Swiss banks. You just told, told me the fact that the Griffins are Swiss even further. Anyway, sorry, Moonlight, you wanted to say something? I just want to say that, um, and I have to clarify, but I don't know which one is. The Griffins are equivalent to the Holy Roman Empire after its fall, and before, because it encompasses that area. They're extremely infighting the entire time, and they have a very large love of gold, and really only once in their history were under one ruler before they fell to petty infighting once more. Well, I, I, mm, we don't know so, how much they did that. We know that there was definitely was at least a king once, and had infighting there afterwards and before. But we don't know how many times that happened. And this isn't the Great Burb Concordat. This is the Great Zeb Concordat. Yes. We're not, let's not dwell too long on Burbs and how much they fight each other too. But yep. it does inform how they would act. And with regards to the Zeros being more imperialistic than Equestrians, though Equestrian or Griffins did go to war at some point, as well as Equestrian with Dragons, um, it would make sense that the Griffins are pretty mercenary inclined in general. And so. I mean, being an empire, the zebras would probably find what um, Griffins have to offer is um, most interesting. Like, okay, yeah, you have skills that we want as a growing empire. Let us pay you. I and, mean, and the Griffins are like, okay, yes, this is a partnership. We approve. I, I just want to step in here, just a brief thing, um, to quote uh, Machiavelli a little bit, paraphrasing. Uh, <laughs> don't fucking keep an army of mercenaries. They only care about the fucking coins. Keep a professional army. Keep keep it in house, dummy. <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. sure Ma Machiavelli didn't say it like that. No, he didn't, but I'm pretty sure that's what he meant. It's a point. Probably. It's a point that matters. And in this case, I see that uh, 
They perhaps would use Griffin mercenaries in a bit more riskier missions, potentially, that basically they can toss money at, instead of <laughs> using their own own trained soldiers to do the job. Especially considering that Zebras do not have any way of flying. If they need someone to fly, they, oh, hello, there's a Griffin mercenary group. Let's hire them. <laughs> yeah. I can see them being used in their conquests, mainly for situations where it's like, oh, it's Zebras, we can capture them this way. And then the birds fly in. So they have good relations with the, the Griffins because it's like, here's your gold. Just make sure that you, you know, fly through this area and drop some rocks. I imagine it's more like they would be the equivalent of cavalry in like early warfare in between the zebras. Like since everyone is cavalry technically, the, a race that can Shock fly troops. is basically cavalry for you. Shock mm -hmm. troops. That's also true. It's the air force. It's the air force. <laughs> I mean, I was about to say the winged hussars. <laughs> Please not bring up the, the winged hussars. We don't want to talk about the winged hussars. And then the winged hussars arrived. Anyway. Okay, uh, but... Uh, um... Gallant? Mm hmm? The fucking cats. Yes, the fucking cats. The Abyssinians. Because the, the yes. fucking cats um... exist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we want to care about the movie, that is. Instead of a four-legged creature, we have a two-legged creature. Oh, actually, that's standing on two legs. Okay. And yeah. we also have the two-legged griffins. Or oh, that's true. Yes, harpies. Um, what we're contending with here is, thanks to the movie, furries are now a thing. Ugh. Which is in a desert South America. Yeah. Which is coded as Africa, actually, in the show. Mm -hmm. Abyssinia, well, it's... If you go by the name, it's Ethiopia. Yeah. But, but Ethiopia. So I would like to point out that the name does come from a cat species. Yep. Yep. So uh, Abyssinians are indeed a type of cat. Pretty so okay, what we have seen is well basically nothing. Aside from they have their apparently their own continent from Equestria. So depending well. depending on how much zebras did um ocean travel walk, I, I can see your eyes glisten. Um <laughs> but if they did do ocean travel, then maybe they would have met the cats. If they didn't or just happened to go in another direction with their boats. I I don't really see much um, interaction between the two. I, I think it could be. The, the but becoming we have less, no evidence in whichever way. The becoming less in my eyes, uh, uh, some fucking cat people. Just the fucking people from cats transplanted into horse world, and more no. like Atlanteans. No. Do not. No. From we we see a bit of them before the movie actually shows them within the comics. Yes, I bring up the comics, but whatever. Excuse me. Yep. Um, they have a kingdom, and it is. It is pretty heavily coded within Middle Eastern uh, Islamic cultures mm -hmm. due to a lot of how they show everything, but then again, cats look mean, so whatever. Um, I don't know. Um, but the bit we do know about them is that they do have a desert like area that they mostly reside in, which would give us more of the Fertile Crescent sort of zone for them. I imagine, you know, given the map that we have, they basically just fall in, in the area that... Um, they basically just fall in like, the uh, Iraq kind of area of the world. Yeah, I, and that's the Fertile Crescent. Iraq, for... Iran, that area. Yeah. 
Um, so which... basically, former Persa. <laughs> I was avoiding saying that, but yes. <laughs> Someone had to. They're from Persia. But yeah, I, uh, Kirin. Think... Um, well, I could say Kirin exists in one of the conquered areas. I as mean, a group of their own. As far as we... of um, Far East. As far as we understand, the Kirin don't exactly have a nation, as it were. They're basically more like... A number basic... of enclaves. Yeah, a number of enclaves, like a tribe. Maybe they talk to each other. They're not really a cohesive nation-state as we would understand them, though they may potentially have something close to that, like a very loose confederation. But we don't really know that much. And that... It would make sense that they have a number of different tribes that exist, or enclaves, whatever you want to call them. Because we have the one that is in the Cairn Grove, which is set in Equestria near the Griffin and Equestrian Land Bridge, which is a thing, apparently. Um, but it doesn't mean that Cairn Jones is outside of that. Same way that Yaks don't hunt have more places than the ones say that we see in the show. They could have far more than that, and that's just their capital. As for the Karen Grove, it could be a situation of that's just the one that is within Equestria that Equestrians had a myth about. Maybe it also has potentially religious significance to them. Maybe this is the place where they were born, as it were. Like, um, for example, uh, this is a bit of an example from Lord of the Rings. Um, Mount Gundabad is a place in the Legendarium of Tolkien where Durin, the first dwarf, awoke uh, and it has a great significance religiously to all dwarves. So this might be their equivalent of Mount Gundabad. It might be the place where all Kirin came from originally. That's why there's so many Kirin there. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then they have through, because I mean, the Kieran Grove, I haven't seen it, is a very unique geological structure. It is basically a cracked uh, plateau that they live within that has a that that's kind of what they try to find outside of the Kieran Grove for where they set up, and because of that, they have very little presence in the world because they're exceedingly uh, Specific on where they want to live. Uh, ah. um, but yeah, I, I think since Kieran... I, I like the idea of going off of... They are very specific in where they want to live. And that would mean that maybe zebras have the same sort of... Some mythology about them, but not much real contact. Because it's like, well, we can literally just ignore the one place that they're at and not have to deal with these literal walking and talking... Horses made of fire. Yes. These, these demon horses. These walking, talking hazards to our cities. Yes. It's better just leave that alone and just build the empire around them and just make sure that they don't see it so they don't venture out and wonder what's going on and then set everything on fire. Pretty much in this case, it's, uh, it's a case of just, if they don't, if the living toasts just want to be left alone, we leave the living toasters alone. <laughs> yes. So they, they probably have some myths about Kieran and Nerex. Probably thinking that Nerex are their main form, which would be amusing. Yeah, kind of like yeah, Amazonian natives, Lavender. Yeah. Like, everyone leaves them alone. Like, okay, there's coming spears, um, um, arrows, and death. Don't fly but in this case, it's fire, more fire, and death. Maybe we leave them alone. Yeah. But yeah. They don't um, want contact. We don't want contact. Let's yeah, let's just pretend. Covers, it? Let's pretend they don't exist. And like they don't exist, let's move on to our next uh, our next species, um, dogs. So. There's a 
there's uh, a little bit of headcanon that's coming into this, just a smidgen here. Um, this is a, from Homelands. They had a diamond dog-like species that looked like hyena men, basically. Knolls. Ah, uh, uh, Knolls, yes. Which I imagine are closely related to, uh, to diamond dogs. They, I imagine they had some kind of a common ancestor at some point. Mm -hmm. I would honestly say that I agree that uh, they had common ancestor, which I think at some point, much like how people left Africa at some point, um, is um, some of the gnolls made their way to Equestria like fucking eons ago and settled there and gained the nomicer diamond dogs. Mm -hmm. So basically same thing, went a bit of evolution in some thousands of years, maybe milli millennia, we do not exactly know. And same species, just in other way around that the species isn't coming from Equestria, but other way around. Yeah. I mean, and it is not really shown that they have much of, like, a society, as it were. Very much similar to that of uh, Kirins. Like, obviously, they have something internal for themselves that you can define as society, but they don't have, like, a state that the zebras would be interacting with. I think in the comics, they do have a kingdom. Oh, okay. But I am not entirely sure. Let me check. Carry on. Um, while Sarah checks on it, we do know that the area around Mariposa was exceptionally inhabited by diamond dogs, hence the reason why they became hellhounds, and this is probably a big issue. But that to me makes me think, if they were initially gnolls, which would make sense, or whoever gnolls came from as well, it could be that part of the reason why equestrian gems are desired is because they're magical properties and that actually caused the change. So it wasn't evolutionary, it was more of, hey, there's this shiny rock that, you know, they can make use of in some fashion and that caused a change within their society and their species. Wait, am I remembering wrong that the Mariposa dogs were, well, essentially slave workers? Um, that is true. Bombs dropped. Or the mega spells. That that actually came from Project Horizons. They were uh -huh. treated as Native Americans in the base story, where they were basically told, "Hey, we want your land. Get the fuck out." I mean, we did have literally a Native American stand-in at that point, but you know, let's do extra Native American stand-ins. More of them. Let's be dicks to more people. I mean, that was kind of the running theme. As it is, I think in that situation, probably a relative or um, side species from, like, if, if we take the idea that, like, crystal ponies are related to normal ponies, but because of where they live, they're crystal instead, we have diamond dogs and gnolls, and diamond dogs are the way they are because of where they live, and gnolls are the way they are because of where they live. It makes it, it it tracks with the internal logic of the universe. I mean, yeah, it does somewhat track. Uh, Sour, are you back yet? Not yet. How are you responding to me then? Ah! I mean, I'm I'm back, but I'm looking for the info still. That's Maybe what I mean. For the treaty arc. I forget the name of it. Because that's where they talk about all the different nations in the comics. Which, How interestingly enough, that they don't cover the zebras. They cover every other species but them. Because it I seems mean, that yeah. no one wants to talk about zebes. But sorry, Nexus, you carry on. Yeah, for some reason. Well, the only show that I've been 
the new series of comics that the supposed season 10 but mm -hmm. um, there's not that much there either yep yeah. though they do talk about having four princes that rule it which would point to having different primary cultures within it well multiple cultures within it that are large and dominant over a large region Otherwise, you wouldn't have a, basically a four-person senate. So I checked. Um, so so what checked? Up... <laughs> All right, carry on. Sorry. Be be happy that you're in Britain and I'm in Finland, because I would drown you. Um. Yes. Huh. So, uh, demon dogs have a kingdom of their own. Where okay. it is, we do not know. So they have a but kingdom. They do. However, however, that doesn't mean that gnolls have a kingdom of their own. Maybe zebras overtook that kingdom, and now it's part of the empire in a yay uh, situation. Slight aside here, um, why so many kingdoms? Why no republics? Because... Fairy tales! Yeah. That's it's stupid probably... and you know it. Yes, it is. Fantasy. It's it's just as stupid as the head of our state is a princess and not a queen. Because queen sounds scary because Disney. I mean, like it's Did the it same the role. Thing. Like, for example, the the quote unquote King of Wales is called a, the Prince of Wales. You can have the place as a principality. That's just the that's, that's the same fucking type, same kind of job role, just different title. Yes, but it's still silly, and I don't like it. I mean, because when you okay, this is a little off topic, but all the evil people are kings and queens, except Queen Novo, which is a notable outlier in this. A fair point, yeah. well made. But let us continue. Uh, so, the dogs have a kingdom. Yay for monarchs, I guess. I mean, all these species are species so far. So, let's move on to our next one. This one definitely has a monarchy, though, again, they're kind of, it's a lot more loose than uh, many would expect. The dragons. It's a yes. monarchy. Sorry? It's a, I'm the biggest and baddest, so I rule monarchy. <laughs> well, I, I was saying it was a self-elected because it's like, hey, go grab this thing and then you're king. And it's like, okay. That means they're electing themselves because they do it all themselves. But, uh, the very Yay most... for the weird monarchies! Yeah, that's basically the entirety of the set. Um, I need to elect you to be king. <laughs> Well, tough shit. That's not how elections work in monarchies. Yeah, but I'm basically... being repressed. Um, basically, elected me as king. <laughs> yes, yes. Moist paints throwing swords around. Uh, we have now run out of all of our Monty Python references. Um, but basically, dragons migrate. Mm -hmm. I would um, suggest as a herd cannon that they they um, migrate to Zebra Empire. Since times immemorial, immemorial, so, whatever, uh, like always been like a period of big fiery fucking dragons entering and fucking shit up. Maybe we should do something about this. I know. How about we establish a connection that isn't murder? Yes, I, since it is known that dragons did help the zebras, so my suggestion for a cohesive thing about this is that knowing that the dragons migrate to a certain part of the zebra lands, they go, dragons, can we call your friends? Okay, this land here, it's all yours. It's 
uh, we, we won't do anything to fuck it up. It's all yours. Do what you want with it. But here's the but. Uh, it's now a marchdom of our empire. Uh, we won't ask for your help often, but if when we do, please help. Also, um, it can be uh, added there that if they do migrate from between uh, zebra lands and Equestria, then if the zebras actually pull that bargain off, they can then say, hmm, but your other land is actually not yours. How about we help you with that? And boom! Dragon loyalties! Yes. Uh, to build off of that, when we see the dragon migration, it is from north to south, and the dragon lands during the show canon is south of Equestria near the Badlands itself. So it could be the fact that they're part of a later sphere expansion of the zebras, and they're like, well, we'll just now strike up a deal with them, and then later on they migrate to Equestria, and they're like, oh, well, this is awkward. <laughs> we also know that when Equestria was close to its first when it was first founded, because I mean, Star Soul was alive when it was first founded, and so were the pillars, there was a war between Equestria and the dragons, which is probably the first time the dragons migrated to what was then a proto Equestria, and thus there was a war. So the Zebras probably had an easy time saying, hey, we won't fuck you over with the land that you just left, so we don't have war. You can go fight the Equestrians. Yeah. It's like all these Pekasai are like, fuck dragons! And the dragons are like, well, you look like ponies, what are you going to do? Nothing to you. Fuck yeah. their friends. No wonder they, they kind of hate ponies. Yeah. Must seem really hyper... Like... <laughs> Hypocrite. Hypocrite. of ponies to be like, no, friendship is wonderful and magic, and and why are you laughing? <laughs> friendship is magic, except when it's with you. It also yes. makes as to why the dragons continue to, as on at least an individual level, uh, wreak havoc on Equestria, because they're effectively just in a long-term Cold War, and there's just a built-in you know, cultural animosity towards questions. It's like, yeah, no, they're fine to pick on their assholes. <laughs> I imagine just on the basis of these dirty horses say they own our lands. I say I'm hungry and I'd like some lunch. Pretty much. Why that happened in the show? It's a little disturbing. Yeah. So yeah, um, dragons, massive dicks. Because ponies at the time were also massive dicks. Yeah, and mm. dragons, con considering that they live a hell of a long time, okay. considering that Torch was one of the dragons in that war, mm -hmm. mind you, and he doesn't look like he's killing over anytime soon. So yeah, um, like uh, they they so... they remember that time, and also because they live so long, they probably don't fucking care. Like you know, they have didn't they didn't take the time to learn that ponies are different now. Yeah, very much. Oh god, dragons are the elves. I was about to say that. <laughs> are the elves of um my little pony? Well, that means Kieran and dragons really hate one another. Probably because the dragons can't kill them with fire. Yeah. And they They're just like get angrier. <laughs> Oh, that's they underestimate the Shit, they ate our fucking gems. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, next is hippogriffs. Hippogriffs. Um, I mean, they have like, what is it? Like Mount Eris as a place. That's where they live. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're pretty much, I imagine, at best, a city state. Yes. yes. They live on a city state. Have a great time with that. Mm -hmm. Not say... very many seem to know about them. Like I, I would say I would say they perhaps trade or perhaps they're isolationist during this time, seeing as there's a war going on. Well, during yeah, the time. I imagine that they don't want to upset anybody because they they probably look hoarse enough 
to be eaten by fucking dragons. They look griffin enough to be shot at by zebras. They look like they look aggressive enough to just, you know, be everybody's enemy. And they just want to go, ah, thanks. I think we'll, I think we'll not. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that they sit as a neutral state in the war. They're like, uh, let's not, and we'll take refugees. Because they can just turn on some fish and shove them underwater. Switzerland. We actually raised a good question about its location related to the Zebralands and Equestria, because if it's closer to either or, it may then become a prime spot for any espionage activity. Yeah. I imagine we actually have an official map showing its location. Yeah, from from the maps that we know, it's closer to the horse lands than it is to the stripe horse lands. Well, it's south of um, what do you call it? Yeah, it or whatever. It has a constant uh, equestrian sized landmass between equestria and itself. Isolated. Okay. However, since it is on the a body of water that connects two oceans, it could be a trade hub between well everything. Well, yeah, like the, if you live on an island somewhere, somewhere between two big land masses, that's pretty much a license to be a wealthy trading state. I mean, for all we know, they might have all the best trade wins. Yeah. Mm. Either a wealthy trading state or a fortress. Look and given the them. fact, and given the fact that hip that hippogriffs, if I remember like they had like like flying machines. Yeah. No, they have uh, a actual navy. The flying machines come from the, the parrots. Non-winged griffins that are anthro. The parrots. Or harpies, depending on who you ask. And the, the movie literally calls them griffins, which confuses the fuck out of me. Let, let us just skirt by that issue entirely. Yeah, they don't matter. Yeah. Suffice to say, they got a very favorable location. That would have made them probably very rich, uh, trading between the two of them. They, they pretty much would pull a fucking Parthia. Yeah. Um, given it wasn't until the Strong King era that they had the whole turn to fish thing really as a common thing, and one of the things they missed was having a navy, they probably one of the, were one of the premier explorer species next to griffins. Almost but actually, certainly. But they probably made diplomatic ties, unlike griffins, because they're a bit more set in one place. So it would make sense that the zebras would have some connection to them, but no rule over them. Yeah. Like, they know they exist somewhere. They've been visitors for a long ass time in their port towns. Uh-huh. But beyond that, it's like, hmm, they're somewhere. And we trade occasionally when they come to town. But that's about it. Yeah. Ooh, then we get to the fun part. Kelpies. Which in the season 10 exist. Oh my. Oh, and in they the zebra fucking... homelands. And they look fucking weird. Yes. Yeah. Which is even more interesting given we have a Kelpie previously existing within the comic books that looks entirely different. So either they have shape shifting powers, which is alluded to that they can turn into water, or uh, they're two very distinctly different brands of Kelpie. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look that they have shape shifting because it, it's less brain hardy. I. Kelpies make me very uncomfortable. Oh. Um, I don't like the creatures that live in the sea. I, I, I am not a fan of the Innsmouth people. Okay. I'll put it that way. I, I don't like the fish people. I imagine most of the races around them don't like them much either. So they are not uh, so much... Well, they're not fish. They're more like... them. They're more like water itself, apparently. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, the ones on the right. Kind of like water elementals. Yes. yes. They can uh, apparently have three forms. Gas, water, and solid. So literally water elementals. Then. Yes. So they're literally water. Uh, literally water. Boy. In that case, it would make sense that they are found pretty much across the world, and they mm-hmm. take a form akin to the native population, so that way they stop trying to spear their watery form, which is rather annoying when you're trying to talk to them. Yes, like, can you please tonk? Then stop doing tonk! Can you please stop That's trying to murder me? To Would that, could you do that for me? Bonk. For fuck's sake. Yes. You know that they apparently can exist as a gas, that means not even Kieran really can do much to them because they just make them gas. It's just yeah. like, okay. And then there's the other species starting with an A that I totally do not remember. Abo. Abo. The Abada? Yes. The ones in the middle on that picture, apparently. Yes. They're interesting. Mm. They look very sp- special. Yes. I must say, reading about on the kelp, is, to me they see, to me they look like, or appear to be like some sort of spirit, as they get, they have three different forms, and if they're, and I quote, if they're too, if they are away from a water source for too long, they start to evaporate. So yeah, oh, they're, yes. they're, they're just fucking water elementals that live yes. everywhere. Yes. So pretty much, I believe that as they just tend to be everywhere and some of them will be a bit more uh, in front of them pretty much everybody, they don't have, probably don't have their own state or something they have or their own tribes nearby the coast or any what water body and thus they pretty much go like truck don't care yeah, yeah. like they try exist. to invade us they... we don't care <laughs> these are things that exist they're not really a threat maybe we'll talk to them about getting some fish yeah. probably mm. the only way you can actually get them to probably be on your side is for coastal defense at best. Yeah. And even and, then it's mostly because they care because they live there. Yeah, I, it's I, more I, of a uh, regional guard or militia than a mustering them into the army because they're like, yeah. well, if this, this goes terribly enough, I just go back to Sequestria because that's a separate thing from the hippogriffs. I would, uh, I would think they would get very upset if you do any sort of uh, water pollution there. Oh yes, they would get yeah. super angry. They get, they get annoyed. Because you're literally poisoning them. Yeah. Like, they get annoyed to the point of in the comic with one form of Kelpie, hypnotizing the entire Ponyville to knock down a dam because it's in their way. So... Yeah. They, they probably don't like anything happening to the water unless they're, you know, talked to first. Yeah. What does not they do mean? Don't mess with them. <laughs> yeah. Unless you want to walk to a lake and drown. Unless you want to do a fucking Emperor Claudius and declare war against Neptune. <laughs> I mean, that was Caligula, but yes. Caligula, sorry. <laughs> the... The man who fucking elected his uh, his horse to be a senator. Which in Worse Worse MLP Concord. would be far less um, surprising. <laughs> <laughs> and again, horses are Salaradians, which are somewhere else as well. Yes. Hmm, well, maybe in the MLP universe it would have been, you know, the, the Roman Greek Pegasi ele- having a mad emperor who elects an earth pony as a consul <laughs> or something. <laughs> On the matters of flying. <laughs> I feel I personally think... attacked by this. In any case, I think we're getting a little off track. Here. Yes, we are going very much off track. This is yes. very much a... Uh, uh, speaking of Greeks, Minotaurs. 
Yes. Calling it seafaring <laughs> creatures. So you're going with basing them off of the culture that they originally arose from. Yes. Which is, Cretan culture, which, which makes sense. Would make sense yeah. that they eventually find their way to uh, uh, Zebralands, <clears throat> Egypt, um, Cleopatra, um, and so on. I imagine that they're I don't know, also. I just really like them. Yeah. I also imagine they might be the only democracy in this universe, and oh, they're yes. also they also have city states like the Greeks, mm. fighting each yes. other all the time. Yeah, yes. or or like their literal namesake, the Minoans. You know, a, a city state on an island. We did. Well, those are more like temple states as far as well, I yeah, like understand. Them... We actually, fun fact about this, this is again a bit of an of a, an aside, we actually don't know what the Minoans actually called themselves. Yep. Yes, that's true. But they have most JoJo's Bizarre Adventure type of clothing. Yes. Because, yeah. damn. Like, tits out, sun's out. <laughs> Wait, even the other way around. Yes. Minions were badass. Yes, but moving on. Uh, so I imagine that there would be. I imagine there will probably be lots of different uh, positions that the Zebras would have had with a, every different uh, city state. You know, mm -hmm. they, I imagine they would have wanted to, you know, leverage uh, the fact that they aren't a single unified entity uh, mm -hmm. for their own personal gain. Uh huh. And you know. One city state they have friendly relations with, and the other one they're going to war. So, yeah, basically, I can or see, something like that. I can see that both Equestria and the Zebra Nation will have a proxy war in, with within Minotaur lands through, through, through this part of the country. Yes. Yeah. I do love me some Cold Wars. Um, I actually see going off of that is given we only see, I think. Grand total of two, including the comics, uh, different Minotaurs. They mm -hmm. probably are in close proximity to the Zebra Lands. And with that, it's probably a situation of yes, there are many uh, different city states, and due to their proximity, probably within the second sphere of expansion to the Zebra Homelands, while they are all still separate, they are mostly dealing with zebras and occasionally crossing the ocean to the cluster. Mm. I imagine they would, um, you know, the moment the game became a cold, from a cold war to a hot war between the zebras, they do what Greeks did in antiquity and um, uh, put aside their squabbling and stab them repeatedly so they can get back to stabbing each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once an Basically, external force come in, they... <laughs> Suddenly, that's a great unifying force. <laughs> they yeah. would basically be the zebra equivalent of how the Griffins worked with Equestria. It's just mm -hmm. like, oh, hey, there's a war now? Uh, yeah, let's get this over with real fast. Uh, Sphinxes, I'd see as less of a people of their own and like classified client. more as a sentient monster. I mean, so, they're probably like a client species of the zebra, because that the part of the world they come from pretty much would be dominated by zebra. Yeah. Yes and no, because I mean, it depends on how much you want to take from the show with, uh, you know, their Talking horses. Just within Equestria. Mm -hmm. That's the place we see the single sphinx that exists, and that's in a flashback. Yep. So not even could... a flashback, a story. <laughs> uh, so it might be a situation of that they are extremely solitary creatures that are long-lived along the lines of dragons, or I, I, I'm just thinking that because they're so large. Um, mm -hmm. And they're basically effectively considered just monsters that you can kind of reason with. But they're they're probably just like a rare sight in any 
area because they seem like a solitary type who just, you know, take a cat nap inside of a box shaped room within some ruins and then get pissy when someone walks in and starts throwing, you know, uh, riddles at them. Yeah. I imagine that. I mean, that... I mean if I just like to grab refuge in some ruins and some curious the four-legged horse started talking to me, I would ask a riddle. You know, I imagine they might have a very close relationship with the Abyssinians, seeing as, you know, they're look quasi-related to each other. I mean, I could also see that the Abyssinians, like, they have their own rulership, but there's a separate part of it that is advised by a sphinx, because they have a lot more... Uh, life to work with. Mm. Mm, also, I can kind of see Abyssinians be like, yes, we do in fact come from the Sphinxes. I imagine that might be more of a religious thing, that. Yeah. Mm. Or general like uh, thought. Mythology. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sphinxes probably are a non thing within terms of relationships and neighboring with the zebras because it's probably a we found one situation instead of we found their nation. Hmm. Going from there, we have donkeys next because I don't think there's much more to go with uh, sphinxes. Yeah. yeah. Donkeys, I could see be basically like a neighboring or initially was a neighboring um, nation, yeah. eventually absorbed into the zebra homelands. I would say they might see them as a, some sort of kin, because, fun fact, zebras are more donkey than they are horse. True. Yeah. True. They can breed donkeys, but not so well with horses. Yeah. I mean, you can... But basically... Like, I actually... Basic... Sorry, you, you say your thing next, uh, Sour. Sorry, I wanted to ask next as a question since he is kind of like a big uh, zebra nerd. Yeah, so uh, basically, I could see donkeys have a very, very, very good relation with zebras. Like, the conquering of their own kingdoms was such a long, long time ago that no one really thinks about it anymore and, and they're just and they have the same rights as zebras do. So for example. Mm. Uh, you're going to say something now? Uh, yes, so can zebras make fertile offspring with donkeys? No. At least not as far as I know. Um, there have been, from what I remember, because I did a fair bit of research into it, is not very likely. There have been a few cases where it happens, but it's one of those things where it's like, don't don't count on. Like, at least with donkeys, they can produce offspring. With horses, it's a question of whether or not they'll even produce. And there yeah. were some serious attempts to domesticate zebras that way. I imagine it depends on how that individual zebra is, how much it is already closer to donkeys, genetically. Hmm. Well, actually, I that's just, a thought. I've just researched this. Um, uh, like mules and hinnies, however, uh, zongis, that's the name for them, are generally genetically unable to breed due to an odd number of chromosomes disrupting meiosis. Hmm. Yep. Well, here, here's the thing. Like, um, so there are multiple uh, types of zebra. Um, the most, from what I understand, the imperial zebra is the most. Gravis. Sorry. I think you mean gravis. You know what I mean. But yeah. they're, they're the the most commonest of common ancestors to all. Uh, living zebras. Mm -hmm. I imagine they might be able to actually interbreed with donkeys and have fertile offspring. 
in MLP world or in ours? In ours, but you know, we we don't know. We we don't know if it's in the MLP verse if it's a single species with lots of subspecies, or if it's uh, or if it is just a oh, sorry, if it is just a single species or a more wider net of subspecies. Yeah. Also, apparently, zebras can have colors too, and I quote. I am not sure how I feel about this. Yes, apparently, albino zebras are golden. Uh, or a gold-ish also... color. Excuse me? Um, yeah. Albino zebras turn out kind of gold, like golden blonde. It's just straight out, straight out kind of dirty gold. <laughs> um, there are a few late species of zebras, uh, and extinct species of zebra that have brown stripes as well as gray and black stripes, which gives you some color variation. Yep. Um, I mean, the brown stripe including ones are usually the mountain zebras. Well, they have larger proportion of those. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, this would explain uh, gold, like golden stripes. Um, in Punish Horizons, sun stripes. Sun stripes. Know. Sorry, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Yes. But yeah, that that would explain why this is a thing. That that's fun. Mm -hmm. This is um relevant. And getting back to the actual topic of donkeys. Um, and we see their relatives also in clusters, so it could be a situation of way back there during the expansion era of the zebras, they conquered uh, donkeys, and some of them left to cluster and became a minority population there, just because it's like, well, our land's gone, and we don't like the people who took it, so fuck them. Hmm. I mean, there's, even if um, the uh, zebras and donkeys had a pretty okay uh, relationship. There's always going to be a few who are like, I don't like this. Fuck it. I'm leaving. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it would also make sense because in the show, they show that the idea of uh, donkeys and mules, because both show up, are not uncommon, but they are not a large number within the Western population, which leads to me thinking of a situation of there was some portion that moved there at some point or were there beforehand, and it could just be a situation of, again, like diamond dogs, as we discussed, where there are two divergent populations on two different continents. Mm -hmm. As is, I think it is safe to say, no matter what, uh, both ended up as client species for another empire. Mm -hmm. All right, then. I'd say that's about it for them. All right, so I think this is actually probably a good place to call uh, a short commercial break so we can get some water and pee. Yeah. Um, yes. So please, enjoy some, uh, enjoy a sunset, uh, sorry, enjoy a Sparkle Cola ad. There's a reason Sparkle Cola has remained Equestria's most popular beverage since it was first introduced to the public. Not just its refreshing taste, but also because Sparkle Cola uses only the finest Equestrian ingredients. And we add just the faintest hint of magic for that refined flavor you can only get from an ice-cold Sparkle Cola. Because we're a company you can trust, ran by real equestrians, you can be sure that Sparkle Cola's spectacular taste just can't be beat. And for every Sparkle Cola you buy, one bit goes to supporting our mares and stallions in uniform. So sit back and enjoy the great equestrian taste of Sparkle Cola. Sparkle Cola. What you want is a spark. And we're back. So, 
Let's move on into the next chapter of tonight's discussion. We had already covered pretty much everything about zebras, uh, their homeland in their landish sense of the word, and their nearest neighbours. But let us move on to be more specific about them. Their early history and their mythology. So, as we know, ponies had a very specific kind of discovery myth about where they came from. Uh, the three tribes period of their history. Comparatively, we know very little about zebras and where they came from. So, they, they must have some sort of myth for it. I mean, for ponies, it's it, that tale is about unification. It doesn't explain where they come from. So, it explains where they came from as a nation. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to cover specifically, you know, their creation. It doesn't have to necessarily all be, uh, be a literal creation myth. It can be the idea of where they came from as a unified idea. Okay. But, Pretty you know, it, it, we, it would be good to actually have a bit more interesting information about where, like, the ponies came from. Where did they actually, what were, uh, where did they come from originally? Rather than, you know, their unification myth, as it were. But that's and that's uh, an an issue far beyond the scope of what we're trying to cover here. Yes. So, where what 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 do you think that they actually did? Like what what was it they came from? How did they get to be a something? Well, considering that, <clears throat> I think. Uh, the zebras had like um like the unified nation is fairly recent in Fallout Equestria. At least it's younger than um, than Equestria is as a nation. So I'd imagine for the longest of times it was probably um, tribes of varying sizes. Again, taking some cues from Africa with their various um, uh, groups of people like, like Yoruba, uh, Zulu, and, and so on, with uh, different kind of history and uh, how to say, uh, relation to other tribes. Which would give into the whole idea that they are Unified in the way that equestrians are, in the sense that we're all ponies. Zebras, it's, they have a bunch of different tribal variation into subspecies, and overall they are unified in the fact that they are zebras. And it could be that is how they end up having some of their, what would you call it, client species under them, is due to over time and pushing their expansion as an empire, they've had external threats which made them unify. Outside factors that allow the empire to create a narrative of unity? Mm -hmm. Of some kind? I mean, it could be a situation of around the time that Equestria's myth, which is questionably a myth, of how they left the frozen north to settle mainland well, central Equestria. It might have been a situation of what had caused that being Wendigos expanding the frozen north. It caused other species to push down into their territory and they retaliated, becoming a more imperialistic situ uh, more imperialistic species. It's like, hey, we're losing land from this external force, and we have no relation to what's going on up there, so we're just going to take it as form aggression. So I think if equestrians were forged by friendship and and stuff between between um, uh, warring tribes, essentially. Or uh, tribes that were at best in shaky 
shaky bits of peace. With zebras, it was, those fuckers are coming to get us. How about we fuck them up instead? Yeah. They, they, they unified with war. Yeah. <laughs> would, you, would you like to brain your neighbor? Yes, let's go fucking do it, boys. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, that is how a lot of empires started, was they got upset at the foreigners pushing into their land and said, fuck this, we're going to take all of them. Yeah. So, Essentially, I would imagine that the first rulers of the zebra lands were warlords. Yeah. Just simply warlords. This is my bit of land, that is your bit of land, and that is your bit of land. And there's an external force. How about we stop fighting each other and fuck that guy up instead? And basically going the same route as the Greeks. Actually, that would make sense further more with how we postulate the uh, Minotaurs are, is if that's where the Zebra Nation came from, is this sort of same situation. They know exactly how to play off of the Minotaurs in their multiple city-states being at odds with one another. They're like, yeah, we know that. That's our, literally our history. So, it, it would make sense that they have some great external threat that they considered as the necessary thing to forge themselves into a singular nation from proto-states. Yeah. And I could see that little by little the empire grew to involve more zebra tribes. Like, for example, it started with two or three tribes against a common enemy. Then uh, some years later, another common enemy, but we need more people. So a couple more tribes join in, and this repeats until basically all the tribes are like, okay, let's be one nation. Basically. I mean, I can I can see that being the case. Uh, well, what was, the, what was I going to say? Um, oh, Brain, what are you doing today? Not working. Yes. Uh, never mind. They basically just unified because something else was trying to kick them into the ground. Yeah. Either yes. a bigger warlord, so the smaller warlords work together, okay. or something more dangerous. Like, I'm thinking probably dragons. They could have been dragons. Could have it been could ponies. Have... Could have been ponies. Could have been um, actually, I was thinking it more likely to be minotaurs, because if they relocated from somewhere more north to a more southern hemisphere area that's akin to their normal climate, because of the whole Wendigo fiasco, they True. probably would have been a pretty warlike situation there. And I, a minotaur would be Pretty scary to a zebra. Yeah. So, from that, they probably also have an event akin to Hearth's one. Not to jump the gun into the next thing, but it would be a Unification Day celebration. Yeah. And it would be like, hey, look, this was the day that we, you know, finally won against whatever external threat it was. I mean, I know we're trying to think about creation myth for them, but I don't think there's really much place for one in the universe because nothing really gives I us a Hmm. I mean, there is a thought uh, about that. They don't have the same kind of mm, hyper powerful deific uh, entities to them, entities that controlled in very important aspects of the world to them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, given that all of Questry, they do talk about zebras interacting with spirits a whole lot, it could be a situation of they believe themselves to have been created by the spirits, hence why they have relations with spirits. But again, it's a situation of we don't have much to go off of with every other species that we know 
a fair bit of detail about on what they believe was their origin. So it could just not really have one that's major in any society. Hmm. So and um, I can kind of see that there's still um, a myth version of the events themselves, like there's a some great figure, for example, in in their history who, who probably wasn't as amazing as depicted in in the in the stories. Basically, a Caesar might not even be a real th person. Like, for example. Yeah. Um, in Chinese mythology, the first emperor they had, I believe, was Yu the Engineer. And there's no real evidence that he even existed. But, you know, it's a myth, and it has a very powerful message of this was the moment that China started down the path that made it China. Mm. Yeah. Or it, or it was a real person, but it was so long ago that there's no real um, definite uh, evidence that they existed or not. So I kind of like that idea. I yeah. could see that becoming a sort of yeah. ceremonial title for whoever is their leader. Yeah. Yeah. Like I can see Caesar, um, Kaiser, whichever you, way you want to say it, be a title that is somewhat different from um, princess or king or any of that sort. Well, at least the term it basically just referred to someone who was, well, at least originally meant to be like someone who was descended from Caesar, who would be yeah, dictator for life. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, it would be the Caesar analogy would be just, hey, here's the hero who united us and thus we use their name in honor of them yeah maybe a part of their um maybe a part of their it probably be fair to call it kind of a monarchy if you more like actually it's less a monarchy and more like just an autocracy rather than mm -hmm. something with a royal family but maybe part of it is that they have to be able to recall their lineage back to someone who could recall their lineage further back to this great hero. Yeah, and that's yeah. quite like. Okay. It's... Yeah, it can introduce some interesting uh, suggestions, especially when it becomes a bit muddy, where where the uh, the new mm. courses, etc., etc. Politics. You entered my territory here. <laughs> oh no. I do love uh, me some politique. Yeah, uh, but it also means that, as it's, uh, yeah, the the empire practically united under one creature, but it's not actually that pretty much because it's a different tribe. Definitely, they different tribes will have some sort of a say in this massive uh, oh, yes. entity. The, I'd the say a senate. Like. For I know how much people hate uh, straight up Rome um, metaphor for zebras, but I think the actual political structure itself lends itself well to zebras. I actually... There's a unified um, group from all the tribes and then a head of state. Yeah, like I actually. I thought about this, me and Nexus thought about this to some extent, and what we discussed was that the Caesar is, they are the head of state, but they don't have any direct power, as it were. More that the Senate is what actually wields the power, they're just making the Caesar's will manifest. Yeah, I will see that the Caesar is the head of state and the head of army, at best. <laughs> Yeah. But the Senate, or whatever its uh, equivalent is, it could be... There's multiple words for this particular thing. Especially as it's basically the local governors or dukes or tribe leaders, whatever it is. It could be 
some sort of a parliament at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's my uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, my thought of it was that since they do have a more of an identification to the region they, that their subspecies came from, it would be a situation of you have your local leader, and then they have someone that they send to the centralized government as effectively a unelected representative. So we're going straight to you know Roman Republic situation, because then you have the Caesar, who, with regards to that, is basically at best a tiebreaker, and for the most part, is just telling them, "Hey, this is what I think we should go with." What do you think, because you're actually from these regions and know what the fuck they actually need, but they also have the military back them up in case the Senate decides to just, you know, go off the deep end. Yeah. And I can see to Zebra's ancestry means a great deal. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the way I imagined them or head cannon more, more likely, um, is that they have some form of ancestry worship. So uh, burials are important, ancestors are important, and thus your ancestry matters, especially if you want a high political career. So being able to say, I come from this general eons ago or, or something like that is going to bolster your career in politics. Hmm. And maybe other things, but like army. So it but... really does matter where you come from more than being competent at the job. Not uh, I think, I it's... think like... It matters that you're competent, competent, but it also matters if you're related to some great general or like they expect you to excel. They are really more willing to give you the boost. So it will be sort of like a tiebreaker between two. Equally good. Yes. Yeah. It's like this person has a lineage of, you know, some really cool people. This one doesn't. Both of them are content. We're going with one that has a effectively a proven history. Yeah, yeah. prestige matters. Yeah, yes. like basically, uh, well, most of Roman Empire emperors had some family lineage. Like my grandpa was this and this person. Elect me. Well, it's an awful <laughs> lot because like political dynasties kind of had the apparatus to keep themselves in, you know, a powerful position. Yeah. And if you were a liked general or or a um, small-time ruler or something, surprisingly, people were looking at you like, hey, you have potential. And then that potential was Caligula. And no. <laughs> <laughs> and then they caligula That's not a good thing. Yeah. Oh. We got a little off topic, I think. A little bit, but yeah, I think maybe. this has been useful. Like, it's kind of discussing yeah. how the polit uh, they may have established themselves as a political entity. Like, where yeah. was their... Uh, like, we, we, we established that they came from one potentially imagined hero that united all the early tribes together against some sort of threat and that's what decided the early history of how they uh how best to put it organize themselves yeah all right then well let's move into things that would have affected them that weren't directly uh you know related to their establishment uh everyone's favorite crystal uh King Sombrero. Oi, I take offense to that. Hmm. Uh, so, what what were they doing when he was doing his lark? Well, maybe I'll start because I already like, I thought about this. 
of course I have. Yes, that um, let us uh, somber worshiper talk. <laughs> Uh, basically, I think Zombra wouldn't have had much interest at the time, mind you, at the time, expanding. Because you don't expand before you have your own turf under proper control. And I don't think Zombra was all that ready to start conquering other places. So, honestly, I think he was fairly um, isolated to Crystal Empire at the start, and then, like, Princesses came, and that was a shit show. So, I think Sombra is fairly unknown to Zebras overall. Like, okay, in some foreign land, this happened, There was apparently. some. There was some weird uh, unicorn king that uh, subjugated some rock horses, apparently. Fuck yeah, if I but, know if that one, but what like, that means. Yeah, like, they got stomped by a royal intervention. Yeah. Like, it would at, I think, at most been like, oh, I heard from this sailor that stuff like this is happening in the equestrian side. Fuck yeah. if I care. <laughs> his, his influence wouldn't have gone really anywhere. It's more of a uniquely equestrian situation. And even then, it probably was not even that much of a whole cluster thing. It was pretty much just the Empire because there's almost no information on the Crystal Empire as the show states. And in it's my shots. book, that, in my mind, it, it's a situation of, hey, there was some kind of kerfuffle in cluster. What happened? I don't know. Something about crystals and slavery. Okay, anything else? No. Yeah, like most of the equestrians were probably like, the fuck's happening there? Uh. Yeah. It's fucking... If if it ain't about crops, clouds, or debauchery, I don't care. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, at most I could see some for care about the yaks, because they're literally the neighbor. But yeah. even then it's like... Mm, not gonna go there before I have this under control. Fee fi fo fum. Gonna crush some pony bones, mum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think very many were daring to go against the X overall, so okay. I don't think Sompra tried. <laughs> I, so in that case, probably, if Sompra had more time, I'm looking at the princesses, <laughs> he would have had a bit more of an uh, he would have been a bit of a uh, problem to zebras as well. Yeah, but definitely before that, it would have been Equestria uh, yaks. You know, Maybe we, yaks before Equestria uh, you, know, yeah. you know, we actually don't know how far his ambitions actually stretched. Like, he could have just stopped at the Crystal Empire. Yeah. He could yeah. have been very content with just the Crystal Empire. Like, I have an empire of my own. Fuck that place. Yeah. Don't come knocking on my door. You know, create, create an immortal mortal god kingdom for himself. Yeah. And then the princess has I mean, come knocking. Yeah. And I mean, if season nine Sombra that I do not think was actually Sombra, um, <laughs> more like more like some strange puppet made by Discord, um, only 10 was like, hey, I could take over Equestria. I'm going to say that Sombra, thousand years ago, was not thinking about that. I think yeah. he was a little bit busy with other other things. You know, I was actually thinking, uh, when the princesses showed up, like, they would just knock on his front door, he opens up and he says, uh, Sombra, no. you're kind of stealing our act. <laughs> like, at, at most that I think Sombra would have done if he was not looking to conquer more was want to have uh, the Zebra Empire acknowledge his rule. Because that's a thing. Yeah. yeah. Acknowledge me as a ruler, as an actual nation, as a, as a sovereign nation. Yeah, having a... And we are, we are pals. Yeah, having an empire recognizes the sovereign is 
really prestigious. It's very yeah, important if you've uh, yeah. only just established yourself as a nation, at least on the ground. Yeah, Which... thinking about it, considering how with the uh, Zebra, uh, Zebra Nation creator myth, that type of thing, uh, Zebra Nation could probably have said, oh yeah, you're a, you're a legit ruler. Potentially, yeah. it just depends on how they view his actions within the realm. I, I would imagine maybe not the slavery. We, we don't know. We thing, just but do not know. Yeah. But I could imagine that he, or the Zebra Empire, as they are themselves, formed from a war uh, point of view, would be like, no, nah, that's a legit tactic. D dispose of the earlier ruler and take its place. Probably has happened in the Zebra Empire f a few times. Wouldn't or surprise me at all. <laughs> he keeps wearing his ugly head here every so often. Why is Claudius such a big character all of a sudden? Well, he's kind of an interesting character because he was the uncle of um was uncle, he... of Cla uncle of uncle of yeah yeah he was the poor and the grandfather <laughs> and uh, i think grandfather of nero so, yes yeah. grandfather but, of nero but he was relatively sane and careful ruler unlike caligula and nero <laughs> yeah, it must be said that uh claudius is thought to have been murdered poisoned by his wife, which was Caligula's sister at the time. Caligula's sister. Yeah, we did married Bob. Oh, no. Oh, oh. Oh, dear. BG is dying. Yeah, BG, is yes. dying. BG don't stop dying. Yeah, sleeping. I have muted you for now, BG. Um... Send me a message once you've cleared up the crackling. And they're just trying to be... Okay. So that was right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were talking about Caligula. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Claudius was married to Caligula's sister for political reasons. So, uh, Claudius you know, was yes. then potentially poisoned by by their sister, whose name I just now escaped my mind, so to basically get Nero on the throne, which was the sister's uh, son, and then Nero, in his infinite wisdom, killed his mother. <laughs> yeah, that's Roman politics for you. Yes. Yeah, that sounds about right. And yeah, Nexus... Also, also Claudius was one of the first people in Roman history to get um, the Praetorial Guard on his side to um, kill his predecessor. Not rain on your parade, but... Mm? Not rain on your parade, but um, maybe a little off topic. Yeah, yes. just a smidgen. Uh, let's just head back Sorry. towards uh, the next big threat, uh, Discord. The one that actually may have had some like long-reaching effects on them. Yes. Yeah, the economy because... got definitely got fucked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's hard to say really because they have absolutely no idea of how far his power reached. Like, not in the sense of how powerful he was, but like would he even bother with the Zebra Land? So did he just fuck around with the horse, horses? You know, how far reaching was his just presto changeo? How about we make it rain chocolate? And let's make yeah. the landscape bad. I'm but... sorry, but I'm now imagining just zebras looking at strange pink clouds with chocolate ra rain coming down. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> Is this oh, an omen? End of time. <laughs> is this an omen? Is this some sort of horrible fever dream to bring the end of the world? I mean, imagine that happening. Uh, in the what, real world. You were, what you were about to say? I'm literally just throwing my arm here because I'm trying to get a word in the middle. Uh, basically, 
if drawing parallels to the uh, the zebra and bus creation, the zebras would probably see this particular event as another massive threat to their realm if it ever reached their shores. That's the thing. So probably that would be another unifying force to then somehow tackle this issue which lasts for some amount of time and then get solved by equestrian princesses, but they don't probably know that immediately, so they will see whatever they did as the correct result. Yeah. Okay, or a correct solution for the result. But It'd be a bit man, like... Man, stop the clouds. Holy shit, it works. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like that weird one time when the mayor of Warsaw just spontaneously combusted. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, essentially like that. Yeah, like, I can imagine that Discord probably didn't even know that he was causing problems in the zebra side of things and honestly wouldn't have cared. But <clears throat> at the zebras are like, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck, what is this end of times? The, the biblical end is near. And then the current ruler is like, men, step the clouds. And, and at the same time, Conveniently, the, the princesses uh, vanquish um, Discord's rule, and they're like, holy shit, it worked. Stepping the clouds worked. All hail this great hero. <laughs> yeah, that's the gist of it, but probably something a bit more uh, less jokey, let's say. <laughs> Just tapping hey. clouds. <laughs> okay. It probably is. It probably gets more played up in retellings and re yeah. history. Yeah. In reality, it was probably throw javelins. That worked. What? Yeah, and in the stories, it's more like uh, you gotta wonder though. Take take Greek uh, strategy uh, strategies, and you've probably got the point. All that divine intervention and heroic demi demigods and and whatnot. You're gonna want Truth was just, a little sillier. Just what sort of things did they do? Well, Discord do that is. I mean, we really don't know anything that Discord did outside of the little flashbacks that we saw. So, and even then, there was. Fairly little. Yeah. So it could have very easily been a thing of that was just something that was going on localized entirely in Equestria. And that side of it is just like if anything, you know, any rogue clouds got away, it would cause issues for the zebras. Yeah, as fun as it is to think about, you know, Discord messing with the whole planet, it's probably going with the people who are getting the most reaction, which was Equestria. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's kind of what I was alluding to at the start. Yeah. So I think Discord, they might have a bit more knowledge of it just because it was such a bigger thing that happened. And the Air Code even then Zebras in Equestria at that time and were like, we're taking that shit back. This place is batshit crazy. And they have some stories about what happened. And that was possibly even the beginning of the tale of you know, the two sisters. Well, I would say this is a whole lot of ifs and unknowns, so maybe let's move yeah. on to the next. Yeah. Mm. And finally, the big other big baddie before, you know, the obvious, really outlandish one, uh, Tyrek. Well, personally, I hate canon uh, centaurs as neighbors to the zebra land, so he and Scorpion would Definitely have walked through it. Hmm. Whether or not they absorbed any magic is... Questionable. Yeah. Maybe... Yeah, this will let you bring up the question of how magical are zebras? According to season 10... Not very. Not at all. Not very. I mean, if that is the case, it would explain why Tyrik and Scorpan didn't stop and just kept walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 
it was, I mean, Tirek knew about Equestria and ponies that had a lot of magic. And that was probably always his like main goal, get to Equestria. But there's this landmass between us, walk through it. If anything, it's great endurance training. <laughs> And possibly also looking at how like any other sources of magic and you know yeah yeah I mean for uh, T Rex many flaws stupid is not one of them that mm -hmm. that look actually no there is actually one more um, uh, entity that we can talk about before the one the big main event entity is it the bug mom it's not bug mom no what. Uh, storm, the, the storm, king. Oh. Storm, ah, storm king. So, storm king, given the way that he's portrayed in the movie as having conquered a good chunk of the world outside of Equestria's purview, I mean, he hasn't touched the Griffins yet. They don't really have much for him, but he probably has Griffins that work under him. Um, mm -hmm. Zeros probably are in a full-blown ground war against him and his forces, and that's probably the reason why he turned to Equestria to steal their magic, is to finalize the war against the Zeros. It's like, they don't have magic, let me just get four princesses worth of it. Uh, ho hold on, hold up. The Storm King, this apparent military man who is fighting a war against the Zebras. And losing. And losing, decides it's a good idea to open up another front against a, a nation that has potentially apocalypse bringing fucking magical artifacts and god creatures. I, 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 and I, yet, I've seen this, some, I did see, I've seen this movie somewhere. And yet, Equestria got conquered in a fucking afternoon. I think that's more of a movie thing, though. <laughs> you know. uh, I'm gonna say that parallel that Galen just made made me think of Storm King as following the same military logic as Japan. I mean, that's kind of that is precisely the fucking thing right there. Um, well, the thing is, is that he had prior experience with uh, other pony-like creatures, see him doing a blitzkrieg against the Hippogriffs to the point that they just said fuck it and went underwater. So he's he also has a clustering on his side who's like, they have no military. Just roll on up. Yeah. It, it's not even he's starting another war. He's just like, it's just free real estate. And goes for it. Oh, basically it's going... Yeah. Yep. I mean, but that, even if the question doesn't have an actual army, which... I mean, it does have yeah. like the the what the the e the UK. royal guard and does it, like, does that is like a fucking joke. It, even if you admit that they're a joke, and they are, uh, they still do literally have apocalypse weapons in the uh, in the uh, elements of harmony and god creatures. He so, may not know that. Two points on that. One, Tempest is younger than the main six. She would not know that the elements of harmony were a real thing instead of myth, and only know of the three princesses. She didn't even know Twilight existed, and she went in there with a uh, basically stormtroopers to assault directly on the castle with a weapon that nullifies their abilities. It was a well coordinated, well planned attack to cripple the nation. Mm. I'm just also saying that they would have. Uh, the equestrians also had literally the god of chaos on their side, like, didn't which know that. was probably also not known. Mm. I mean, also Discord is like, at best, he's um wild card. He's a wild card, but he also doesn't want to upset his friends, and he does actually yeah. consider his friends valuable to him. So he could but... just go snap, and how about you have your 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 device be turned into an equal volume of pudding. Yeah, Again. but at the same time, he's thought of having Twilight as a ruler is, hey, let me resurrect one asshole, add two more assholes, and uh, 
um, dethroned Queen, asshole, and make them work together and fuck things up really bad. So I would not trust Discord's intuition in situations like these. Yes. Honestly, also, he could have been like half a way across wherever chaos dimension he has doing stuff and be like, oh shit, stuff happened apparently. It's just a thought. In any case, I, with, the, with that basically idea of um, Storm King attacking Equestria in order to gain an advance over the Zebras, doesn't does really... make... Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry, yes. Let me continue. It it doesn't make any sense when you take into account all the interlations, you know. But, as mentioned, he didn't have all the intelligence. Yeah, he had asymmetrical information. Yes. Mm. Also... He, he acted on the info he knew, and with that info he saw that a quick strike against the capital to basically cripple the entire administration is the best thing to go for. Unfortunately, there were factors that were not in the... Not that in plan that completely ruined the plan within seconds. Basically, he pretty much went with the Japan tactic. He tried to yeah. Japan and it worked just as well for him as it worked for Japan. Honestly, yeah. it worked for a while. If Twilight had not Deus Ex machina um basically the entire uh, uh, ending of the movie with a very not so subtle uh, messiah archetype thing going on. Storm King would have won. And actually, he, he won. He, he did win. actually win. For a while. More proof that the sisters yeah. are rank incompetent. Yes. Yeah. But this is, uh, this is why we need a republic. But basically, this all, all of this doesn't really matter because the movie's events would not have happened in the Fallout Equestria universe. At least not as is. Hello? So the question is well. Basically, is um, does Storm King happen before the ministries are made? Before uh, um... I think yes. Yeah, what it could have been was instead of it being Equestria basically turning into Sasha and killing him, it was a situation of the movie could have still happened even with Twilight not being Alicorn. To be one hundred percent fair. Um, but I see that that could have been a situation where the relations between the zebras and the dragons were called upon, and that's what turned the tide of that warfare. They also mm. have left the zebras very in debt in terms of crystals for paying their dragon allies. Ah, so this, it, it is, ah. this works. This makes some good sense here. That explains the impetus to can increase the volume of crystals from uh, Equestria. Cause wars, because wars, unsurprisingly, are very expensive. And Indeed. would give, give the dragons more reasons to help the zebras during the war. Basically, they're the Iron Bank. That, that's the reason. Uh, like They've already sunk a num amount of, uh, of money and effort into this, they'd like to get a return on it. And this sets up the whole um, issue between the two nations industries going head to head of, okay, we will just pay you flat in gems for coal because it's a cheap deal for us. We have God knows how many crystals in the ground. We, we can just grow them over a couple of months or years. L. They have yeah. an entire empire made out of crystal. Well, not so, just yeah. that. They literally have farmers that grow crystals. Yes. yes. Yeah. And 
part of the reason why they would be so desperate for Crystal isn't just because, you know, they have to pay up the dragons. It's also, if they use it as part of their culture for other things, they're probably really hurting for it. And because of Equestria taking advantage of that, it makes things not so kind. Also, Equestria probably not coming to the aid of them during their war with the Storm King. Or if they did, they have issues during the rebuilding. Because Equestria yeah. might just capitalize on it. Also, Equestria has had a wonderful history of not giving a fuck about other creatures, to yeah. be perfectly honest. So I can totally see them be like, what? Storm King? What's that? Not our problem. Oh, no. Yeah, not our problem. Except once it comes to, you know, their door. Yeah. Speaking of coming to the door, once the actual question gets a bit uh, shaken up, is it time to move on the major plot point? Yes, Nightmare Moon. Yes, m- Moon Butt. Angry Moon Butt. War of the Sun and Moon. Mm hmm. Yes. Because I, d- I don't care what the show says. It was an actual war that happened. It wasn't just basically an anime boss fight. Yeah, I, one night. What the I hell? Believe that situation might have been more Nightmare Moon playing on Celestia to just take the show. And Celestia had come there to try to reason with her sister towards the end of it. And just said fuck it at that point. But as for the rest of the world, they have an issue of depending on where, how far away they are and how big the world is, they might have had constant howling winds in eternal twilight or being slowly baked by the sun itself. Yeah. Yet another um, moment of. Zebras getting a good, good, uh, little apocalypse going for themselves. Like, okay, end of times. We are literally being roasted alive. I I would like to point out is that the first apocalypse with Discord happened not long before the second apocalypse with Nightmare Moon. They did things a thousand years ago. It probably is closer to 200. Uh, year span from 1100 to 800 to 900 years ago because we do that with our own time where it's like oh it was a thousand years ago in reality it was like 950 granted so, but you know it for the for them it'd probably it's, still be a pretty close period of time yes, it, it was one or two generations for everything happening back then which is a little distressing yeah like Okay, when I was a little child, a foal, I remember chocolate rain, and now we're baked alive. What the hell? <laughs> Those fucking ponies, can they stop trying to end the world? Yeah. So I must add here yeah, that uh, this event is supposed to drive in the point that the Zebras now have a somewhat of a fear of Nightmare Moon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's Just the sun that that's making them. Basically, it's the they fear the they fear yeah, the pony the of the night for bringing them the sun. Yes, they fear the pony of the night because they 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 like having sunlight. That's great. They love that. That's great shit. Mm. Would have ten out of ten. Would have another day again. Uh, <laughs> But uh, they don't want day all the time. Mm-hmm. Fair point. So it's more the absence of night that they probably blame ah. Nightmare Moon about. Ah. Like, why don't like... you take the night away? Also, why the fuck is your face on the moon? Like, that would probably be also when not explained to them, like, what's happening and what caused this. Imagine... What looking outside of your window after this apocalyptic event to see that the moon has a picture of a mare on it? It's got a fucking picture of a horse with a horn on it. What? Yep. What the fuck is going on? And the your 
massive neighbor that you consider now a bit of a rival is now ruled by the literal sun princess. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, probably worse, from that, I can say they probably infer that the whole situation, especially if they just talked to anyone because it was a literal war, was the fault of the younger sister, and she got banished in her element of the moon. So they are probably like, okay, well, the sun didn't mean to burn us, but that explains why we constantly saw the moon you know, not being there, or if it was, it was like right on the horizon, is because it couldn't. And they, they, they're probably initially, you know, they think that, oh, maybe Celestia won, she was the one causing Eternal Day on our side, and they realize, wait, they don't give a shit about us. It was Eternal Night over there. It's not her fault. I imagine it would be less like literal eternal night and more like, you know, living close to the Arctic Circle. Because Sometimes. Cause they would have died of famine if it was actually eternal night for that time. My thought on that is that Celestia and Luna, or well, Nightmare Moon, fighting with one another caused it so the sun and moon swayed a bit so there was some variance in light. So they did have kind of days, but it was like being in the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. Which, given the planets still rotating in a different way, that means, again, there would be a point that would be, for the most part, just being in twilight the entire time, which would have a great front row seat to all, as they have constant howling winds. Because the heat difference on either side. Also, right. massive tides. Oh yeah, oh, yeah that like, too. I imagine any like coastal communities in the zebra lands would be going, oh no, oh yeah, no. Yeah, that oncoming tsunami, like, <laughs> fuck. That's, that's probably how they ended up being friends with Kelpies. Yeah. Yeah, that would like, mean they. Can you, that's can you help us? The sea is trying to kill us. <laughs> Kelpies reforming a seawall. I imagine the Kelpies <laughs> wouldn't have uh, appreciated it much either. Because mm -hmm. if. Think about it. If the sun is only hitting one side of the planet for how long? Days? Weeks? How much mm -hmm. water is going to evaporate from the seas? Mm -hmm. Not to mention lakes or rivers. Oh, it would rain pretty much constantly on the lunar side. Oh, definitely. Yes. Mm. It would be a constant have... fucking nightmarish, rainy oh, hell world. While yes. in the zebra sides, it's basically like um, trout season on steroids. Some Mad Max. Like, you've seen those, if you have watched, like, animal documentaries, there's always, when you go to Africa, they show that, show that um, dried up river. It's that, but for weeks and months and maybe even a year, depending on how long that war went. Could have also been what caused their second uh, sphere of expansion was they're like, we need to get away from this spot so we have some place to actually survive. Yeah. So I, mean, I would suspect a area being baked into desert would cause a lot of people to want to move and be willing to fight for that right. You know, it would yeah. also make the cold north a bit more tolerable. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, this is... Just thinking about the logistics of that fucking war is... In, it, it's insane how much it would just colour everyone's relationship. Mm -hmm. Like, I am just imagining the hippogriffs and all this. They live on Mount Eris. They would have coastal cities that would pretty much be constantly flooded because... They live on the equestrian side of the world. Yeah, yeah which I, I could see why they resort, resorted to the sea pony thing. Yeah, yeah I think they are just... They're yeah. like, mm -hmm, everything's covered in water. We have this pearl that changes us into other creatures. Sea ponies, sea ponies sounds good. Yeah, I imagine for the like the duration of this war, they would just like permanently stay in that form. 
also, I'm going to expect that absolutely no goddamn creature in the neighboring powers nations list was happy with that war. Oh, no. That's absolutely with the, not. With the sun versus moon. Like, I, yaks, I think the everything fucking, melting. I think the entire fucking planet was unhappy with us. Yeah. You know, I imagine that, you know, every single state on the planet would have done something to try and end the conflict in the in in Celestia's favor. Because at least at least Celestia, as terrible as she is as a ruler, doesn't want the world to boil on one side and freeze on the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that also is probably the reason why Equestria went into more isolationist stance for uh, damn near a thousand years because they're like we kind of fucked everything up we're just going to curl up and you know not piss anyone off again Let, yeah. let's just leave Pretty everybody much. alone now um yeah. this was our bad uh you you can you can do what you want now makes sense also so... celestia might have been aware of her own lack of leadership qualities and then want to stress them by expanding yeah I also imagine this might have been, like, if there was ever any more, like, if there was even, like, multiple zebra states at the same time, this would have been the uniting factor. Yeah, the yeah. very last point that they decided, like, okay, no, we need to be a unified nation. Yeah, they might have been several proto-states at that point that had unified for fighting off the external force, and then that situation, I like, we can't go alone. All of us are getting fucked over and we need to work together. And probably sent, you know, a flotilla of zebras over to, to just deal with whatever the hell was going on in Equestria. I and just... Like, Why not send them across the sea? It's a walk and then a swim. Yeah, I just realized the first Caesar or great hero who unified is basically literally just Moses. <laughs> Just, just to make a comparison. I mean, yeah, just, like, Im- just imagine the largest armada ever of literally just angry people from all over the world coming to your shores and saying, I don't know what the fuck you're doing, but you better stop right now. Yeah. <laughs> Probably how the Civil War was ended was that it's just like, uh, can you help us stop the person who's making an internal night here and wants to keep it that way? Like, fuck it, sure. Don't do this again or we're taking you next. It's like, okay. Like this, this is this is how you get everyone uniting against you. For matter, no matter what you do, no matter what, it, everyone's go, it's in their interest to go and fuck your shit up if you do this. Yeah. I that's mean, probably... if it's basically a massive flotilla that just just arrived on Equestria Show, what does Equestria have actually say against that? <laughs> There's yeah, a massive because... invasion Aside from... force on uh... their land, right there and there, and it's basically giving you help. I imagine, um, I imagine, like it, each individual constituent part of that armada wasn't very big, because yeah. they still have a whole, like they have a land bridge that is inhospitable to say the be- to the least. Mm-hmm. They have a wide sea between the two of them, so transporting more supplies would be difficult. The land you're going to is an eternal night, so you're not going to live off the land very much. So mm-hmm. pretty much every single constituent part would have had to have had. A constant supply chain of ferrying new supplies of fresh recruits, new weapons, food, water, everything that you'd need to run a campaign. So the Yamada is big because everyone else in the world is sending something small to help. And probably are able to get through due to the kelp who's are also not happy. That's That's probably how they're able to get most of it through because those seas are going to be an absolute nightmare at the Terminator line. Mm-hmm. And going past that, it's going to start turning colder and colder with a constant hurricane of uncle. It's not a fun time to be on a boat or on hoof. Mm. It's or not a fun to... time. You can get rid of every other qualifier. It's just not a fun time. Yeah. No wonder everyone was like, yeah, fuck Equestria. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like, okay. Equestria, I'm going to call you out on your bullshit right now. You're preaching the, the value of friendship, the magic of friendship. 
Remember the last time you tried to do anything at all? <laughs> yeah, I think the moment Luna ascended to the throne during the war, I think that would have given us a, a lot more allies at that point. Like, I, I, can, I can imagine that maybe the other parts of the world, like, they may understand that yeah, like this. This might not be Nightmare Moon, but we we we're probably not going to be your friends. Like yeah, we, like we remember like what happened last time. Yeah, like thanks. But we're not going to we're not going to actively declare war on you yet. But don't expect us to like you right now. And right. yeah, like you know, to their eyes, Luna is temperamental. Difficult to handle. Uh, selfish. 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 Um, and prone to anger issues. And now she's a head of state. Because that's sensible, right? So basically, the Zebras have a propaganda victory right then and there. Yeah. Not it... just on the home front, but on an international stage as well. <laughs> But that's not necessarily everything. Like, obviously, uh, the zebras took it too far, too. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Like, sure, they had every single international... They had, basically, the perfect situation. It would just take some time to calmly express that to everyone else. Like, we remember the last time this temperamental fold child was on the throne before let's and just then, let's fucking have a form an international and go kick her off that throne and put her sister back because at least she's reasonable and you know any doubts about you know luna being reasonable went out the window when uh she basically went okay we're going to win this war no matter what yeah at that point it was on the zebra side probably like okay panic but it's also that the zebras did kind of go into like a death cult kind of approach towards them. Like that's yeah. not going to help your cause either. Mm. Like I imagine that yes, they had the propaganda victory, but the moment they became like a death cult, demanding that they they kill Nightmare Moon, aka Luna, the entire international stage goes, "We don't like you, and we don't like you." I don't think whose side are we was... on? I don't think all the zebras went to death cold, but a significant portion of their leadership did. Yeah. Likely what happened was there was a portion of them who were like, this is just like it was with our forefathers. We need to show our strength once again before we get to the stage of, you know, having to sail up a wall of water to get to the enemy and put them down. While most are just like, oh, this is kind of like history. It's not that bad. Maybe history was a bit wrong on how things were back then. But uh, it's not good. We need to get them to stop acting up so we can go back to peace. Like, I can imagine that internationally, even if Luna pushes for a total war against uh, the Zebras, the fact that she isn't doing her nonsense she was doing before would definitely be endearing a bit more than a death cult trying to wipe you out because you might be that horrible monster in the past. Yeah. And I think that's probably a big schism within the Zebra Nation. It's just like, well, she's not actually trying to you know, wipe us out. Otherwise, we would be currently being turned into beef jerky. Well, horse jerky. Like, she, she, li she is still the princess that can control the sun and the moon. She still has the power to make us have eternal sunlight on our side of the world. Yet she hasn't done this. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Which obviously causes a number of different species, not just the zebras, to be like, maybe this isn't worthy of, you know, destroying the entire world. Not that matters in then, because the leaders pull the trigger, but it's a situation where they're not so committed, so there's Probably going to be some interesting things to come up when we get to actually talk about FOE. Yeah, I yes. pretty, yeah, I can see the Zebra Nation having some civil strife on the matter. Yes, this is been a while since they had a unifying event. This will be one. 
and it's not going quite to play. And hmm. if it's going to play, you get civil war. I believe it has been said that the Grand Caesar during the war was somewhat of an inex inexperienced fellow, etc. Yeah, he was massively incompetent, short-tempered, yeah. and young. Yeah, yeah. so he basically... died right around the cows for the war. Basically, I guess that he saw this war as a somewhat or way to make himself marked in history, unfortunately for wrong reasons. Like, make him seem like the, the equal of that great unifying hero in history. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in his experience, he might have let the military maybe get basically let go of the dogs of war. Mm -hmm. Insecurity, lack of experience, and uh... Big Shoes to Fail is a very bad combination. Mm. Yes. How many times has that been a combination in history? I wonder really? how much. But, yes. Given... Add, more, add some anger issues and maybe, for example, um, more pee, -pee syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> that too? And you have one hell of a concoction. <sighs> like fresh. basically, what I'd what I'd imagine the zebra leader in the Fallout Equestria wartime was is basically Richard the Second. Oh no, that's actually why. No, no, it wouldn't be Richard the Second. It would. I'm thinking more like Prince John, King John the First. Uh, a, a king so terrible, a king so terrible that England has never had another king by the name of John. Yeah. That point, that, but that, basically that, something similar. That, yeah, that that category of just no. It, it might be enough that the surviving zebras, if they did form a nation, said we will never have a single leader again. Yeah. Well, anyway, I believe we've established quite a bit here. I hope someone wrote them down. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to have to rewatch this, aren't I? Yes. Uh... Oh. <laughs> I mean, I can and totally help in that, that but yeah. Side. But anyway, Nexus. sorry? Um, I didn't hear what Nexus said. So I was I'm probably going to help him with that, but yeah. But yes. So let us call this an end to this first part of the Great Zeb Concordat. So this has been Post Apocalypse Talk. I've been your host, Gant Aegis, and this has been my many co hosts today. Would you like to all say goodbye, everyone? Bye. Everybody, take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. And until next time, Maximum Zeeb entering Maximum Zeeb Overdrive. <laughs>